Well, so our, uh, our study today, um, and I, so I read something at the start of the worship assembly that uh, dealt with baptism. So our study today actually deals with baptism as well. So uh, if you want to follow along, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 3 in those verses, and then we'll jump over to Luke chapter 4. So let's start with a reading. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then skipping over to Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. So as always, let's, uh, let's get a sense of, of place. Um, so we're at the Jordan River, uh, which runs from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. And the, the exact location is unknown, um, but we have a hint as to where it, this takes place. So it's kind of in the center of the screen there, just below Perea, is possibly where this takes place. Um, we're told in John chapter 1, verse uh, 28, that John was baptizing near Bethany beyond the Jordan. So that's that approximate location there. And it's roughly about a 50-mile journey from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Um, so it's possible that Jesus may have spent two to three days making this journey to, be, uh, to this location to be baptized by John. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, vigorously protesting, saying, It is I who need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus replied to him, Permit it just now, for this is the fitting way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John permitted it and baptized him. So verse, verse 13 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ came specifically to John to be baptized by him. And we know that according to Luke chapter 1, uh, roughly around verse 26, um, that John was a few months older than Jesus. We're, we're not told specifically when John the Baptist started his ministry, um, but it had been going on prior to Jesus' arrival at the Jordan River. So, and also um, from the other three Gospels, specifically Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, and John chapter 1, we also know that the Lord Jesus Christ came to John alone. There's no indication that family members or friends were accompanying him. Um, at this point in time, he, he hadn't even yet called his disciples. And another interesting here is that, thing here is that the word came in Greek. Um, Matthew uses the word paraginomai, which translates into to make a public appearance. So it's, it's this same word that's actually used when the Magi um, arrived in Jerusalem. So Jesus is making his first public appearance, um, meaning that his baptism wasn't meant to be a secret event, but a public event. And Jesus comes to John to be baptized, and John's response is basically, you're coming to me to be baptized? You should be baptizing me. And, and the idea of Jesus being baptized by him just, just doesn't make sense to John at all. John, John's mother Elizabeth told him, most likely told him about her cousin Mary, who would give birth to the man standing before him, the man who is the prophesied Messiah, uh, who would save God's chosen people. And John knew Jesus' identity um, as the son of God most high. And he even said in John chapter 1, behold the Lamb of God. And so this request by Jesus just blows John's mind is because he was baptizing people so that they would turn away from their sins. And so that when the long-expected Messiah did arrive, those who were baptized would be prepared for their Savior. And Jesus had no sins because he... So he had no need to confess or repent for anything. He's, Jesus, being God, didn't even need to be reconciled to himself. And so there was no need because Jesus was sinless. 
So why would the one who takes away the sins of the world need to be baptized for the remission of sins? And it's with this reasoning in mind that John is actually trying to prevent Jesus from being baptized. The word prevent in verse 14 is the Greek word dikoluen, which means that he's doing his best to stop Jesus from being baptized. It's, it's a, it, the implication of that Greek word is that it's a very, very strong action. It's, it's like a security guard guarding like the, the team locker room uh, at a ball game. It's, you're not gonna get in there if you're not part of that team. That guard is going to stop you. Th that's the implication of the word uh, that's being used here by Matthew. And so John is preventing Jesus from getting baptized and he just doesn't understand why Jesus wants to get baptized. And this, this actually brings us to our first point. No human being is capable of ministering to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people like to think that they can. Um, and those people have been led into the false belief that they can earn their way to heaven, that they can do certain things and act a certain way, and that combining that with faith, that'll get them into heaven. For, such, for those people, obviously, you have to look into their hearts and see if they are who they claim they actually are, and if their motivation for what they're doing is an indication of how they love God, or it may be an indication that they love something else other than God. So no human being has the capability of pleasing God on their own. God is only pleased by the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of those who believe in the Son and his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection on the third day and his ascension to heaven and his intercession for us. John the Baptist understands and scripture begs us to understand that we can't minister to Jesus. Jesus ministers to us. It doesn't work the other way around. We cannot please God with anything other than believing in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this isn't the first time John is actually refusing to baptize someone. Just, just a few verses earlier, he's refusing to baptize the Pharisees and the Sadducees, going as far as to call them a brood of vipers because they really weren't interested in genuine, genuine repentance. Um, with those two groups, especially the Pharisees, it was all about showing off their pious attitude more than it was about wanting an actual change in the condition of their heart. But despite John's objections, Jesus wants John to baptize him. And he gives John the reason why. Jesus says, permit it now to fulfill all righteousness. So permit it now was Jesus' way of saying to John that while baptism or while baptizing him seems inappropriate, to John, Jesus' baptism was appropriate for a special time such as this. And by saying, permit it now, Jesus is actually giving John permission to baptism. And Jesus gives him, gives him a reason why, to fulfill all righteousness. So righteousness in a biblical sense means to be in a state of approval with God. So on a basic level, it's, it's, it's to do good and to be good. But God is the only one who is truly good and perfectly good. Mankind, as we know, always falls short. So the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's doing is he's foreshadowing what he's going to do for the sins of mankind. He was, he was going to fulfill every single law that God demanded of man, laws which mankind broke through Adam, and that Jesus was going to pay the penalty of those sins with his life. And so this brings us to our actual second lesson point. To saved sinners... Jesus identified with sinners through his baptism. So in order to stand, understand what the Lord Jesus Christ means about baptism, um, we have to just, just for the moment set aside our, our idea of the motion of baptism, whether it's full immersion or sprinkling, and consider what baptism means on a spiritual level. So, so John Mulligan, probably about two years ago, presented a sermon on on baptism, and it's worth mentioning that the Greek word for, ba for baptism, baptizo, uh, does translate into full submersion, um, uh, as do the words for baptism in the Old Testament as well. But what, what we need to see here right now at this very moment uh, is not the motion, but the spiritual side of baptism. So baptism is a form of spiritual warfare. Baptism is a declaration to the evil spirits of this world that they have lost another human being from their team. When we are baptized, we become identified with Jesus 
in his death and in his resurrection so that his death becomes our death and his resurrection becomes our resurrection. So by being baptized by John, Jesus identified himself with us in our human faults and in our human weaknesses and took upon himself the obligation to fulfill all righteousness on our behalf, meaning that fulfilling a right standing with God. And Jesus does this by being the perfect substitute for our sins. And it points to something else too, that baptism becomes a precursor to Jesus' death and resurrection. His, his final, his ultimate identification would be his crucifixion and his death on the cross of Calvary, where all of God's wrath was sent like a tidal wave right at the Lord Jesus Christ while he was on that cross as a substitute for all of us. Jesus came to identify fully and identify finally with the people that he came to save. Living our life, dying our death, paying the penalty for our sins, and overcoming the grave. Just like a person being baptized is lifted out of the water, it symbolizes the same way that Jesus rose from the dead. This is, this is what he came to do. This is what he modeled through his baptism. And another reason the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized and was baptized by John specifically was to validate John's ministry. Jesus' baptism uh, was the most unique event in history, and, and it was a one-time event. And after Jesus was baptized, he came up immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he, John, saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, Jesus. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So I want to go back to just uh, verse 16. So behold is the Greek word I do. And every time uh, anyone who in scripture, a uh, writer of scripture uses the word, word behold, it means quite literally pay attention to the words that immediately come after it. So when Matthew writes behold, he wants us to pay attention to the fact that the heavens were opened and what John saw. And then behold, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And if maybe we can all try to imagine what this looks like, what, what this would have looked like if we were standing at the river bank of, of the river Jordan, watching this guy from Nazareth um, getting baptized maybe. And it's possible that this was something only the Lord Jesus Christ and, and John the Baptist saw. Um, we don't know. Uh, whether it was some special vision or the clouds just physically parted and pulled back and a dove descended. Um, either way, God was revealing himself and opening up heaven to show his approval for his son. So the question comes to mind is why the dove? The dove has always been a symbol of the spirit of God and has represented purity and it's represented peace. Um, in Genesis chapter eight, Noah sent out two birds from the ark. He sent out a raven and he sent out a dove but only the dove returned and because a dove would never have feasted on the carcasses of an animal like, like a raven would. So that's why the dove came back. The second time the dove went out, she came back with an olive branch, which is a symbol of peace. The dove was also the symbol of, of the poor, especially of the commoner in ancient times. So to first century Jews, and, and Thomas actually mentioned this in, when he was leading communion, um, to the first century Jew, uh, reading this passage or hearing it, their minds would have immediately associated the dove with one specific thing, and that would have been sacrificial offerings. The traditional sacrifices, as Thomas alluded to, um, were bulls for the rich, uh, lambs for the middle class, and doves for the poor, because a little dove was the only thing that a poor person could afford during those times. And so the, the question probably comes up, why did the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus? It, it, it doesn't make sense because he's God. He's, he's fully God and he doesn't need anything. So the reason that the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus was to empower Jesus in his humanness and also to give a visible sign to John the Baptist and to anyone else watching that Jesus was indeed the long-expected Messiah, the, the one who everyone had been waiting for, the one who was prophesied in Scripture. And sometimes God will give us signs to energize our belief. And if, if you've been a believer for a while, then you, you might be thinking back to times when, when God gave you a sign, like maybe a chance encounter with a friend who 
who may have needed your prayers or maybe making a connection that you needed um, because you needed prayer or maybe another connection where you just, someone just came by to help because you needed a job and it was an answer to your prayers uh, because the bills were due soon and you really needed to pay them. Or finding a church that feels like home after years and years of searching and praying, please bring me to a church that I need to find as a home. God works in our lives to stir up belief like that. And yet, that wasn't the only sign because as you can see in verse 17, we're told that a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and delighted. So now we, if we're, we're watching this, not only see something with our eyes, but now we're hearing something with our ears. And, and this actually leads to our third point. The Trinity was revealed at Jesus' baptism. So the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one place. So if you've ever doubted or had doubts about, about the Trinity, this should be irrefutable proof that the Trinity exists because they were all here represented at one place at Jesus' baptism. God the Father speaks from heaven, God the Son is getting baptized, and God the Holy Spirit descends like a dove to anoint the Lord, to anoint the Lord Jesus Christ. And to first century Jews who are hearing these words uh, from God the Father, they may have, if they were familiar with the Old Testament, uh, recognize references to what God the Father is saying, this is my son. Uh, it, it's a callback to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, where it's written, I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And they would have recognized the reference to Isaiah chapter 42, which talks about the Lord Jesus Christ being the suffering servant. Specifically, verses 1 to 3, where it's written, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul is well pleased. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A, crush, a crushed reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will bring forth justice in truth. So Jesus is the beloved son in whom the father is well pleased. Beloved in Greek is the word Agapetos, um, which is a, actually a variant of the Greek word agape. Um, it means the same thing. It's a deep, rich, profound relationship with someone. And it, it's, it's a love that's worth living for. It's a love worth giving up one's life for. No sacrifice, uh, again, as Thomas alluded to, was ever tru truly pleasing to Yahweh God. No animal was truly spotless. All animal sacrifices had some, some sort of imperfection. Um, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the spotless, unblemished Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so God the Father can say that he is well pleased. That, that's the Greek word eudokeo, um, which means that God the Father examined his own son and deemed him perfect, the perfect sacrifice in every single way. And that brought delight to God the Father. And for those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe that Jesus is God incarnate, who follow his word and bear his image, we too are a delight to God the Father. And, and that's one thing that we all long for as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, God sees each and every one of us and will judge us for all that we did or did not do as a result of how we image his character. We want to hear Yahweh God say, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. And it's through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we are a, a delight to Yahweh God. So Jesus' baptism and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the words of God the Father signify the inauguration of Jesus' public ministry. Um, this is his anointing as the true, long-expected uh, Messiah, and also as the humble suffering servant. But with every anointing, there is always a test. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. So these Two verses actually serve as a, as a preview and a bridge to next Sunday's sermon. 
Um, but now that the Son of God has been anointed, there's a time of testing. We're told that Jesus was led by the Spirit, um, which in the Greek is egatoi nu tevmati. The phrase means that Jesus was not only led by the Spirit, but was also in the Spirit. And they walk step by step and day by day together. And this should be the goal for uh, us believers as well that we should strive for, to walk step by step each and every day with and in the Spirit of God. And there, so there's also actually a distinction with what's going on here with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Greek word for tempted is uh, perirazo, which has good and bad connotations. So it, it's good in the sense that it means to put to a test or to put through a trial. Um, it's bad because it could also mean to seduce or to entice and to pull someone away from God into sinful behavior. Um, Jesus was being led by the Spirit to be tested. Jesus, uh, the, he was not seduced by the Holy Spirit because that's not in God's character. So we're looking at the positive aspect of pararazo, the temptation. And so this brings us to our fourth and final lesson point. After victory comes temptation. Because where God is at work in the lives of believers, so too are Satan and his fallen angels and his demons. And how many times, how many of us have, have had a victory only to fall into something, something really dumb? Um, you've got celebrities, you've got sports figures who celebrate after winning a season or winning something for a team or, and then the next thing you know, they get caught up in something and that just sinks that reputation and it's all over the news and it starts dragging their reputation down. And it causes strife with those people who, who know them. Or worse, how many men or, or how many women have left the church on a Sunday riding high only to fall into temptation? Um, and I wanted to leave you with these thoughts um, before launching into the three questions regarding Jesus' baptism because in Mark's gospel, we're told that after his baptism, the Holy Spirit, Spirit immediately sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the wilderness. There is no lag time between victory and temptation. One will immediately follow the other. Um, and so remember that because some of you may have a victory in the next few hours after leaving here or in the next few days, and you're gonna feel like you're soaring in the clouds. But you need to remember that there is someone who is just waiting to shoot you out of the sky. So after every victory comes temptation. So let's move on to our three questions here. Can you model obedience and submission like Jesus did at his baptism? And like John the Baptist did uh, when Jesus asked John to baptize him. Another reason why the Lord Jesus Christ submitted to being baptized was so that he could set an example of obedience for all of his followers. Because if you're a follower, then you have to submit to and obey God's commands. And this is God's command according to 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 23, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he created the perfect template of obedience for us to follow. And that template begins with conviction by the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to abide in us so that we can bear fruit. Um, just as Jesus identified with us, Jesus demands that we identify with others. So this means that we don't exclude anyone. It doesn't matter what their past is, who they are. Um, again, God's word reminds us, you shall love Yahweh God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We don't get to choose who to love. Absolutely not. We do not get to choose who we, who we love. Um, that was the mistake of the Pharisees. They wanted to decide, well, I want to love this person, but I don't want to love that person According to God's word, you don't get to choose who you love. Doesn't matter if they just walked in off the street. Doesn't matter if they're homeless. Doesn't matter if they belong to another church. We are commanded to love those people. 
And we don't, we don't get to choose who we minister to either or who deserves to hear the gospel and who doesn't. Um, to paraphrase the words of Pastor R. Kent Hughes, if you see fruit on a tree, then you know that tree is alive. If you see good fruit on that tree, then you know that the, th the tree is thriving. Um, it's, so it's not enough to just be a tree um, because we know from scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ actually cursed a fig tree. We have to be trees that bear good fruit uh, because bearing good fruit is the evidence of, of the thriving trees. I mean, you're a tree if you hear the gospel, but unless you understand the gospel and act on the gospel, then you're not bearing good fruit. Second question. Is humility truly a part of your relationship with Yahweh God? Now, you would think that a guy who was considered the forerunner, the one who Jesus said that no one who was born of woman is greater than John the Baptist. You would think that this guy had a pretty, should have a pretty big head. Um, like he had lots of people coming to him to be baptized. He was well known in the area. He was popular and he was liked and he was hated. Um, but that's not what we see on display here in these verses. John the Baptist realized that he wasn't worthy to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't deserve the privilege of baptizing the Messiah, the, sa the same one who he himself called the Lamb of God. John understood that what was needed was for Christ to baptize him. John realized that he needed to confess, he needed to repent, and to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. There's no shame in any of us confessing our need for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has to offer. We have a desperate need for what he has to offer, and that's eternal life. Everyone, rich or poor, famous or unknown, everyone needs what Jesus has to offer. We, we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is calling each of us today to him. He wants us to accept that call. If you think you're unworthy and that you don't have what it takes to respond to his call, then Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can equip a person to respond to that call. The Lord Jesus Christ understands our feelings of inadequacy. He understands our thoughts of being incapable. But when he calls, his expectation is that we'll say yes instead of no. And so the closer we draw to God, the more we'll see that we're not humble enough, the more that we'll see that we need more of the Holy Spirit now, you can never get enough of the Holy Spirit. Um, he's, he's like that mountain spring that never runs dry, but you have to actually go to the spring and take a sip. If you don't, then that's like saying no. And finally, do you hunger and thirst for God? Um, not do you, then the question is, should not be, do you hunger and thirst for the things of God? Do you hunger and thirst for God himself? Um, our belief in God is directly related to how serious we are about seeking God. So when your stomach's grumbling, obviously it's instinct that you want to eat. Um, and when you're starving, sometimes it doesn't matter what's in the refrigerator. It's food. You're going to eat it because you're starving. And it's the same thing when you're thirsty. Your lips just start to go dry. You start to feel weak. You start to feel dizzy. And you feel like your insides are just shriveling up and wrinkling and you will desperately look for water to drink. And that is the type of desperate desperation that we all need as Christians. Like it, it doesn't matter how long you've been a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to have that desperation every day because you need that filling every single day of his spirit, his presence, and his word. And in, in such times like that, you're surviving just on pure willpower. And it, it's the same thing as, as loving someone deeply. It's an, it's an act of the will. It's like the husband who sticks by his invalid wife's side as her life is slowly draining each day and every day. And maybe he has friends who say, hey, why don't you put her in a skilled nursing facility or put her in a care home? That way you can go and enjoy your life and they'll take care of her. But he doesn't do it because love... That type of love, that agape love, is an act of the will. And so we will ourselves to do a lot of things. We, we will ourselves to love goals. We will ourselves to love the finer things in life by giving them our time. But we should have the same act of the will for God. Let's, so 
we should have that, that hunger for God, that thirst for God. And we can do that by trusting and by imitating the perfect man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you seek after God's will, you will, as Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 23, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Because the more you pursue God and the more you strive to image God and you do that with the leading of the Holy Spirit, the more you'll be prepared for the battle against the evil ones. And that is a topic that we will explore next Sunday. But for now, remember that Jesus came to identify with all of us to understand so that we could identify with him through baptism so that we can continue to hunger and thirst for the God who made us. And also remember that after victory does come temptation and that will be what we will explore next Sunday.